Hello and welcome to episode 51 of the Bay to Bay podcast. I'm your host, Seb Fry, and for this episode of the podcast, I'm very pleased to welcome David Aronovici as my guest. David owns and operates Four Seasons Home Inspections, and they do home inspections all throughout the Santa Cruz, Monterey, and Silicon Valley areas. I've been trying for a long time to have David on the podcast because uh, home inspections are a very important aspect of the real estate process, and uh, I'm a realtor. Um, But you know what? David's a very busy guy, and it's hard to uh, find the time uh, to get together with him to uh, spend an hour or so talking about home inspections. But every dark cloud has a silver lining, and both David and I have more time in our schedules than usual for this sort of thing. So um, I asked David a lot of questions I have about home inspections, and uh, I learned a bunch of stuff, and I'm sure that you will too. So without further ado, please sit back, relax, and listen to what David Aronovici has to say. David, how you doing? I'm good, Seth. How are you? Uh, I'm all right, but I'm actually pretty excited uh, today because I finally have you on my podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I've got some time on my hands considering what's going on right now. Right, right. We are speaking yeah. during the coronavirus uh, lockdown, sheltering in place. How's that working for you? It's actually working fine um, outside of trying to figure out what to do with two kids all day. Um, it's actually working pretty good. Um, I mean, as good as it can be, you know, just trying to stay safe and do the right thing. Right, exactly. Uh, me as well. Um, so, uh, David, uh, you know, um, I start these um, podcasts off and I ask my guests to tell me a little story so that we can sort of uh, get to know you a little bit better. Do you have any story you can share that will give us some insight into who is David Aronovici? Well, um, I have a lot of stories. I don't know if anybody uh, that's uh, listening to this would really want to hear any of them. I want the not uh, safe for work stories, David. I want the ones that... (laughs) I I, I didn't say that, but... um, Oh, I I could tell you you a funny home inspection story. It's a real quick one, but it's... I would love a funny home inspection story. Okay, so again, I go underneath the house, I go up in the attics, and there's wildlife around. So this one, actually, I wasn't under the house. I I was in the living room. And there was a bunch of clients in there, and I was opening up an access panel to the hydro tub, which is um, something that I do to look and check out the components in there. And I was pulling the cover off, and right there, about four inches from my fingertips, was a raccoon staring at me. And I immediately put the cover back on, and I actually screamed out loud, and everyone looked at me, and I told them it was a raccoon, and... um, yeah, I'm not sure what I said, and hopefully it wasn't anything inappropriate. But, um, yeah, that, those are the kind of things that I deal with sometimes. And that wasn't the first time I've come across raccoons or skunks or vermin. But um, it definitely keeps <laughs> us on our toes. <laughs> have, you, have you stared down a lot of rats in crawl spaces? I, I've stared down a few, actually, which is interesting because usually you see their evidence, but you usually don't see them. But I've seen them on occasion. Um, I've seen skunks. Um, raccoons a couple times, skunks more than once. Um, yeah, that's about it so far. Um, I don't want to see anything else. I don't want to see long, slithery, slithery things. Um, but yeah, that's what I've seen so far. <laughs> right. Yeah, rats just creep me out. I don't know what it is about them, but they just give me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, they don't bother me so much. Um, what they leave behind can be really pretty nasty, right. though. That's what that's what bothers me because when they're um, when there's a lot of them and they've been in there active in areas, they can really cause a lot of uh, unsanitary conditions. So that's, right. that's what bothers me. And, yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah, you know, early in my career, I sold a house that had had a major uh, rat infestation in kind of like, it was, a, it was a crawl space. It wasn't a crawl space. It was on a hill. So it was like the unusable space, you know, underneath the house where they had yeah. like the heater and the furnace and like, a whole, bunch, a whole bunch of insulation, but it had been completely, I mean, like, it was just like a war zone of rat crap, right? I mean, just like, the whole thing was just like, it was uh, unhuman, and um, I called these guys called crime scene cleaners, <laughs> who they actually clean up crime scenes, you know, like murders oh. and, and suicides and stuff, <laughs> yeah. and they also clean, like, the, the detritus from a rodent invasion, 
And uh, yeah. so I got them down there and I cleaned it out for my client as like a closing gift. It was like, I don't know, three or four grand to like clean out this like, you know, I'm not sure how big it was. I forget it was years ago. But um, anyway, it can be pretty, pretty ugly. So, um, so David, you are a, a home inspector. Is that correct? You inspect homes professionally That's for a living? Yes. All right. Now, you weren't always a home inspector. I imagine that when you were born, you were doing something else. So uh, wh- where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Um, I grew up in Santa Cruz County, specifically in Aptos. I lived a couple blocks from the beach. And, oh, um, whereabouts in Aptos? I live in Aptos uh, myself. Where? I lived right off of Aptos Beach Drive on a cul-de-sac called Wixon Avenue. Oh, oh, I know Wixon very well. Okay, very Wixon, good. Yeah. My dad was right on. a view house, and my dad was a sailor. He was into sailing, and that's one of the reasons that brought him to Santa Cruz in 1970. Um, and uh, yeah, so from there, I just, I, growing up near the beach, surfing was something that I just kind of went straight forward, and uh, that's what I did in my childhood, and, so, and years past, I did that. You grew up in the bucolic aptos of what, the 1970s and 80s? Is that, is that it? Yeah, 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 it, I did, yeah. Wow, must and have been I, pretty nice, uh, so. It was, it was. Did you do a lot of, like, hiking and surfing and, like... Skateboarding yeah, yeah. Or... yeah, I did. Um, you know, we, we Nicey and Marks was basically our backyard to stay parked there. So we would go up into there and hike around the creek. Uh, we did uh, steelhead fishing. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but there's big fish that go up those little creeks, believe it or not, that come from the ocean. We did that. Um, yeah, we spent lots of time at the beach surfing. Um, yeah, Aptos was a playground as a kid. That was, I would not change that for a moment. So, right. Well, uh, so I'm very happy that my kids are growing up in Aptos. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. like it, it is, it's a wonderful place to be. I mean, even now, it's probably not as wonderful. And the reason why it's probably less wonderful today is just because it's more regulated, right? You know, back then in the 70s and 80s, it was a little looser, I think. Well, that, like, that is for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. I don't think anyone's fishing for steelhead at 19 Marks Park anymore. <laughs> no, actually, believe it or not, believe it or not, there's still fish that go up there. Don't, don't tell anybody. It's but a secret. can you get a permit for it, though, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's still legal. It's still legal. Oh, it yeah. is. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, yeah. I think I'll have to take my well, kids steelhead fishing I think, <laughs> in the Aptos I think, Creek. <laughs> I think Aptos is still, um, it's still, it's still Aptos. It's still, I mean, the ocean and the redwoods are basically right there, and you can't change that. Um, it's different because there's more people and, um, you know, the traffic's different and, and whatnot, but it's still the same place, you know. And it's certainly exponentially more expensive to live here <laughs> was yeah, in the a, 70s. That's a, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, back in the 70s, uh, a sailor could buy a house, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know. My parents paid, I think they paid 75000 for the house. Um, on Wixon, which was a you know modest home, probably eighteen hundred square feet with an ocean view, two blocks from the beach. I think they paid like seventy five thousand for it. So right, and that was probably a lot of money back in the seventies or whatever. Uh, yeah, because the house we moved from, we lived on Monterey Drive um, in Aptos, and that house they I think they sold for forty. So they were taking a big wow. jump going, going up to that seventy five thousand dollar range. Wow! Right on. Yeah. So, um, so what? I guess you went to schools here in Aptos, like uh, what, Rio del Mar or, or whatever, right? Rio del okay. Mar, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. And then uh, did you end up going to college? or? Yeah, I guess you could call it that. I mean, um, you know, growing up in Santa Cruz it was and having the, the ocean right there, it was a little more difficult to concentrate on school. But I did um, go to Cabrillo College for a couple of years and uh, – and that was it. That was as far as I went with that. But I, I kind of jumped into I, – I played music and played in a band as well. So I, I played music and surfed and did that stuff and worked. Um, but, I, but I never really went for the, uh, you know, the full four years. The um, full four years. All right. So you're a, you're a Cabrillo guy. I'm a Cabrillo guy, yeah. Yep. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, I myself went to Cabrillo for a little while. And I, I live right in the shadow of Cabrillo College right now. I live just like – a block and a half from there. So, uh, love Cabrillo College. So, um, you mentioned that you were doing music and all kinds of other stuff. And um, what 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 did you what did you do for work when you got out of Cabrillo College? I went into the surfboard industry, surfing industry, and surfboards specifically. Um, 
and ended up doing that pretty much my whole life, uh, manufacturing, and owned a, a custom surfboard factory for, oh, I don't know how long we did I did that. Oh, maybe I had my own shop for 20 years. Um, and what, what we did was we would, there's what we call surfboard shapers, and those are individuals who actually take a piece of foam and shape it into what is a surfboard, and then they have to have somebody glass it for them or, or finish it. So that's what we did. We would take their raw blank, and we would put fiberglass on it, put color, put logos. Whatever they wanted us to do is what we would do for them. And then once it was finished, we'd give it back to them, and they would either sell to a shop or, or an individual or, or whatever they would do with it. But, um, yeah, I did that for a long, long time. Um, we were, you know, we were always, always busy. The surfboard industry um, was strong in Santa Cruz. still is, I think. I still think it's pretty darn strong. Um, yeah, we never had a shortage of work and just, yeah, did that for a long, long time. So you had the dream job shaping surfboards, or not shaping them, glassing them, I guess. We and then you glass. decided to throw it all away on a lark and become home inspector, or <laughs> how did you? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. That's like a uh, yeah. like not a natural progression, you know, no, professionally. Exactly <laughs> no, there's there's a little bit of a story back there. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I did that for a long time, and during that during that period when I was building surfboard, I met my wife um, Jennifer, and. Uh, she joined me here in Santa Cruz. She actually went to UCSC. Um, but then when I met her, she, I met her through a mutual friend. She was in Oakland living up there and um, managing a catering, catering company up in Oakland. We got married, and she decided to come and live with me here in Santa Cruz. And she got into real estate. So that was probably, I don't know, mid-2000, so 2005 or six or something like that. Somewhere around that date, maybe off a little bit, but yeah, she got into real estate, and uh, and so she sold houses, and uh, I uh, built surfboards, and uh, I actually thought real estate was really interesting, and uh, you know I would, I would you know listen to her talk about her deals and things like that, and, and talk about in, inspections and and all the you know the whole process, um, but it turns out at the same time she got into the industry, one of my real close friends that I grew up surfing with. Uh, became a home inspector, and um, so I was like, "Wow, that's you know." I talked to him. I'd actually um, seen him uh, on a couple. Well, actually, let me back up here one second. So what what happened was um, my wife was doing real estate. I was building surfboards, and I was pretty interested in real estate. So we had had a baby, and we were on our way to the next one. And I decided that since she was you know, the mom, and she's taking care of kids, and I'm obviously helping out too, that maybe I should get my real estate license and help out with that so we can both kind of take care of clients and, and do that. So I got my license, and um, I started, you know, going to transactions and going to inspections and things like that. And Jason was his, his name, um, the home inspector. I really thought his job was, like, the coolest job. I, I mean, I liked the real estate part of it, but I thought the inspecting part was way cooler. Um, so I would always, you know, talk to him after we would do inspections and pick his brain and this and that. Um, and then one day I just, it dawned on me, you know, I, I kind of wanted out of the surfboard thing because I've been doing it my whole life and I, I wanted to become a home inspector. It was really kind of like that, like an aha moment. And, um, and then I, you know, I went to him and he was super gracious about everything and introduced me to the whole, the whole thing and, uh, took me under his wing and, and the rest is kind of history, but I've done, I did a lot of other stuff, you know, a lot of other education and things like that um, in between all that. But that's kind of how, in a nutshell, how that happened. Okay, so what, when did you do your first home inspection under your own name or whatever? That would be, that was probably, I think, uh, August, six years ago. So August, six years ago. So what yeah. is this? This is, this is so for, 2014. So yeah. it took you a little while to get there from, uh, it well. from, yeah. Okay. So you sort of eased well, into it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, no. So it, 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 that was kind of a condensed version. I mean, it was years. I mean, it was, it wasn't like right after, um, I got my real estate license, I jumped into the home inspection thing, but it was, it was a few years after that. And then I kind of, kind of toying around and, you know, thinking about it. And then, yeah, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't like from here to there, but yeah, it, it, but to get to that point where I did my first inspection, there was years. I spent, um, oh man, I probably spent over two years educating myself and going on ride-alongs with him and other inspectors. Um, I went to a school in Southern California. I passed the National Home Inspectors Examination. Um, 
I did a lot, a lot, a lot of study. I crammed a lot in in a couple of years because um, there's a ton to know. Um, you know. So yeah, the, that that actually that's actually one of my 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 questions I had for you. Like what 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 what's the training and education that you need to go through to become a home inspector? Is there any? I mean, like. Nope. No, there's not. And that, that's a really, really, really good question because um, there is not. So in the state of California, you could just print a business card and say I'm a home inspector. Um, the chances of you getting hired are probably pretty slim if you don't, you know, if you, if you want to get hired, basically there's a couple, there's a couple different organizations that um, credible home inspectors will belong to. And one's ASHI, which is the American Society of Home Inspectors. And there's CREA, which is the California Real Estate Inspection Association. Um, and both of those associations have, um, you know, a real strict standard of practice. They have a code of ethics. And they also require um, continuing education. And on top of that, you need to pass the National Home, Ex home Inspectors Examination and a lot of other criteria to be met to be part of that organization. You can be a member, but then you want to, then you can go further and you can be certified. And being certified means that you've completed all their requirements. Um, and I'm actually certified with both ASHI and CREA. Um, again, one's national, one's state, so I think it's good to be part of both of those associations so you know what's going on nationally and, and uh, statewide. So, so you went down to Southern California to go to like some kind of school. Is that for ASHI or yeah, who was that for? Yeah, it was, it was ASHI. Um, it was called the ASHI School. I went down and completed that that program, um, and that that uh, enabled me to become an, you know an ASHI member and then start going through their program. I went through their program first before I did the CREA thing. So I, I went through the ASHI program, became an ASHI member, and eventually certified with them. Um, but it took a lot. There's a lot. The, the National Home Inspectors Examination, uh, that test actually um, is pretty tough. Um, and that takes a lot, a lot of time to get that. The best experience I had was I was really fortunate to um, meet not only my friend Jason, but other home inspectors who took me under their wing um, and let me ride along with them, um, answered questions for me. It's a pretty tight-knit group of guys. Um, a lot of guys that, that I mentored with um, are a bit older than me and um, have been successful and have really felt that they wanted to share that, um, you know, the knowledge and the success with, with me to make the industry as a whole, you know, really credible and, and solid so that, that we're, you know, a, a real professional organization that, that does a good job, you know, because we're out there in people's ha houses and, um, a big investment and, and whatever else, you know. So I was really lucky enough to have people help me. Right, right. Oh, very cool, very cool. So the Ashy thing down in Southern California, do they have like a fake house that you guys would go through? And <laughs> I mean, uh, what was their facility like? Well, actually, that it was basically a classroom setting, but we did go out and um, we did go out and look at houses. The, the instructors were local home inspectors. Um, so they knew people in the community that would, you know, let us go through their homes and, and look for deficiencies and defects and things like that. Um, so that was pretty cool. That was really just the tip of the iceberg, though. I, I mean, I, I, I would say anybody who wanted to be a, become a home inspector, definitely take the training courses and, and do that stuff for sure. Um, but that really is the tip of the iceberg. You're, you're not going to get the experience you need um, by just doing that. You really need to be um, doing – inspections and going out there and getting out there and doing multiple ride-alongs with people because it's your your main your main the main way to learn on this on this in this industry is really um on the job i mean i know people don't want to hear that while you're learning on my house but you you i mean i was con <laughs> <laughs> i was confident enough that when i did my first inspection that i was I, I knew what i was doing but it took me you know it took me a long time it took me a long time to get out there and really go you know what i'm, I'm okay i'm on my own um, and I had such a good um, group of guys, you know, mentors, that if there was questions that I needed answered, they would have no problem. You know, I'd get on the phone or email or whatever else and say, hey, what do you think about this? And, and so that was um, really reassuring to, to know I had this, these people behind me. So. Right on. Now, so you mentioned that uh, anybody in California who wants to become a home inspector can just print business cards and go out and start inspecting houses because there's, yeah. there's absolutely no licensing or government oversight at all. It's just completely unregulated. It's, yeah, well, the, the, the California Business and Professions, they do have their code for home inspectors. So there are things that they require, but there is no, there is no, um, there is no licensing. And in fact, they're 
there has been um, there's licensing bills on the book. So, but this year I think it was going to be voted on. I think they something happened. They decided to put the bill on hold, but it's going to happen. It's it's only a matter of time. California will will require home inspectors to be licensed. Um, the stance that my organization, Cal CREA, which is the California Real Estate Inspection Association, um, their stance on it is licensing is good as long as it's good licensing. And some of the stuff that California has been talking about, um, you know, the things that would, home inspectors would be required um, of to get a license um, are not nearly as stringent as what CREA has for its inspectors. So basically, it would probably, if they did it the way they were originally going to do it, it wouldn't be a good thing for the industry because you would get a home inspector that wouldn't have to do the continuing education that I have to do every year and know what I have to know and, and, and adhere to the, the standards of practice that I have to adhere to. The California would be a lot easier for anybody just to go, I want to become a home inspector. You know, I take my little exam, get my license, and I'm, I'm out inspecting homes. And people off the street, including realtors and whatever, you know, whoever else may not understand that just because you have that license doesn't mean you're going to be a good home inspector. Um, so, um, I mean, right. I would say, so what CREA is saying is that if you can come up with a licensing that would be, um, you know, beneficial to the community, um, that we're fine with that. But if it's not going to be um, something that's going to make our industry better, we're not for it. So it's on, right. it's on hold right now for some reason, but um, it is going to happen at some point. It's, it's only a matter of time. Right. Well, that's a good point. Uh, interesting that uh, that the, the state would come up with a, a weak system, which is not really surprising, I guess, given that the real estate licensing is also so <laughs> lax, essentially, um, yeah. that it would surprise me. But I guess there are some states, though, that really have it together in terms of licensing, right? I mean, who, who, yeah, who's well, yeah. really... Who's good about that? Texas? Oh, uh, you know, I don't. I don't know all the states that have licensing. I think um, I think Oregon might have licensing. There, there's a handful for sure. I think Texas does, um, and I'm not sure what their licensing looks like, but I just know for sure that what Korea was was seeing that um, California was doing was not to their liking. And you know, again, we're not against it, but let's let's make it benefit um, the public. Let's make it something that. Um, will make our industry stronger and uh, not just, you know, give somebody a license that doesn't know what they're doing. So, um, again, not a bad thing. Licensing is not a bad thing. We're not against it. But we need to see it be a good thing. We need to see it right. be a benef benefit. That's, you basically describe, like, every single real estate license they hand out. Because right? basically, <laughs> I mean, like, you give somebody a real estate license, they have no idea what they're doing. It's like, there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, Go have fun I, with that, kid. Yeah. No, I, exactly. When I when I got my license, um, luckily my wife had been in the industry for for some years and had sold you know quite a few houses. So I basically would <laughs> I would learn from her. She would basically handle the transaction, but I would, I was her helper. Um, you know, we had a baby and kids and whatever else. So yeah, I mean, I, I would think it would take years to learn how to to do a transaction properly. I, I wouldn't think it would be something you could learn out of a book. You know, I see what right. you guys go through on a daily basis. I mean, I'm still working with realtors every day. And uh, your job's not easy. That's that's for sure. Right. Yes. It's not quite like a million dollar listing. It's a little <laughs> trickier than uh, than that usually. So so David, what's your typical day like? Like okay, alarm goes off. What's David doing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I alarm goes off, and I actually don't use an alarm. I'm I have a built in alarm clock, which is a bad thing. It's not. People say, oh, it's good. It's not really because I can't sleep in, but I get up early, um, get a cup of coffee, and I look at the two uh, inspection reports from the night before. And um, just basically at that point, they're done. But I want to look at them one more time for any you know grammatic errors or anything like that. Um, and then I send them out, and um, you know do what everybody else does and have a little breakfast and get ready for the day. I typically do um, two inspections. I do one at nine normally and one at one or one thirty. Um, and kind of get those done and get home. Um, and home is my office as well. And I, I get the reports. The reports are, are put together pretty much on site. With uh, I have a on site hardware that I or software I use with an iPad, and I can get the report maybe 80% done on site. 
But then I come home um, and spend a couple more hours that evening dialing in everything, making sure everything's right. Um, if I need to do any research on any kind of a, appliances or anything like that, I'll do some, some of that stuff um, and put those together. And um, <clears throat> my wife does all the back end of our, our business stuff, so she sends out all the, the agreements and um, billing and does all that, so I'm, I'm, I'm off the hook for that. Uh, and that's it. And then I you know, do my thing and start again in the morning, send out two reports in the morning and go do two more the next day. Um, so that's, that's a typical day in the wintertime when it's a little slower. I'm not doing, I'm not always doing two a day. I'm doing, a lot of times I'm doing one a day. So my, my schedule is a little more flexy. But in the spring and summertime, I'm working long, long hours. I'm working mostly 12-hour days for, you know, about 67 months out of the year. Wow. Wow. That's a yeah. long day, 12-hour days. Long day. Long days. Yeah, right. not, maybe not always. Not always 12, depending on the condition of the home. I, the homes I've done... You know, if they're clean houses, my day shortens up quite a bit. Um, but, yeah, typically <laughs> right. typically 10, maybe 10 to 12 hours a day when it's in the busy season. But that's, that's when I make the, you know, the most of, of my, uh, my money. Have you ever seen that movie Groundhog Day? Oh, With probably. Bill Murray. Yeah. Bill Murray. Yeah, thinking, yeah, He's I a TV reporter probably. or whatever. Yeah, sorry. You, no, you should go I mean, watch I, that movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'll, basically I'll right Bill Murray gets stuck in, in Puxatawney, New Jersey, or wherever it is, where the groundhog comes out every year. He's there as a reporter to go and, like, report on Puxatawney Phil to say if there's going to be, like, a, uh, you know, early spring or whatever. Oh, yeah. And yeah, he yeah. goes there, and every day he wakes up at the same thing. Like, he's trapped in, like, some sort of, like, you know, uh, time warp or whatever they can't get out of. And every day is the same. Every day he wakes up. <laughs> And it's the same, <laughs> same thing exactly. over and over and over again. Do yeah. you feel like that ever? <laughs> well, absolutely. And uh, uh, but you know what? You know what's great about my job is that it really isn't ever the same. That's that's the greatest thing about it. I mean, one day I'll be up in in um, up in Boulder Creek, you know, off grid, and then the, then the next day I'll be in Saratoga, um, you know, working on a a multi-million dollar, you know, 4,000 foot estate. So it's, um, that's what I like about my job. And I do meet, I do pretty much meet different people every single day, um, you know, clients and whatever or not. So I do feel like that though. Actually, I do feel like I, it's the same thing every day, but it's, but it's great because it's not. I always, it's always, there's always something. And I learned. There's something always something new. And, and I learn something every single day. There's always something, there's never something. I mean, I, again, I learn something every day. Um, so that's pretty cool too. Right. Yeah. I feel the same way. I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't want to say that I'm frequently surprised, but I, I do learn new things very commonly um, mm -hmm. in the real estate business for sure. You know, so it's uh, yeah. never a dull moment, no, <laughs> I guess you no, would say. You know, the real estate industry is something that's bending and flexing and you've got to be on your toes. It's just not, it's not, it's not black and white. It's, it's, a <laughs> it's a meat grinder. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how I feel. Anyway, uh, enough yeah. about me, though. So, David, listen, uh, I've been through so many home inspections, just bajillions of them, and um, I always get – I've seen so many home inspection reports because obviously even, you know, like even with deals that I'm not a part of, you know, like disclosure oh, yeah. packages I'm inspecting for potential properties. I mean, I can't tell you how many home inspection reports I've oh, read uh, yeah, but, and uh, from uh, different uh, vendors and whatnot, right? So, but, but – like, what are the red flags that should really just like you know, uh, you know, just leap out at you? Like, if you're reading a home inspection, like what what should people really look out for when they're when they're reading a home inspection or their home inspection? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, and um, you know, to answer that question, red flag. So, I mean, I, I don't know if this is going to answer your question directly, but there, there's a different there's a different buyer for each home. Um, and there's a, you know, so then there's a different, different house for, for a different, you know, for different people. So what I'm saying is that, so you got, you, let's say you've got a first time home buyer and they're, they're super, um, not paranoid, but cautious um, and, and don't know anything about houses. Let's say maybe they rented in a, a, a condominium and the landlord did everything or the HOA did everything. They didn't even change a light bulb. Well, they could get one of these reports and they could say, Wow, this has a lot of stuff on it. There's a ton wrong with this house, and for me and you, since you know you know these reports backwards and forwards, and I do too, it's a clean, clean report, and there are no red flags on that report. Then you then you've got the house where there's some cracks in the foundation, and the roof needs to be replaced, but you got a contractor coming in, and um, 
there are no red flags for him. So I, I guess, I mean, red flags, so, so that being said, systems, so major systems. So if you're, if you're looking at a house, you, you always want to look at things like the major systems, so the roof. How's the roof look? Okay, so the inspector noted that it's worn. We talked to the inspector. The inspector said, you know, it's, it doesn't need replacement right away. That's a good thing because roofs are expensive. Um, obviously, foundation is another major system. You know, you have a long horizontal crack in a foundation wall. That's probably not an ideal situation. Um, and something like that would need to be looked at by, by a foundation contractor. So that would be something. That, that would be a red flag if you're somebody who was not a foundation contractor or a contractor looking for a fixer-upper. Um, other systems, major systems, you know, electrical systems that have hazards. You know, nowadays, um, electrical systems on older homes, they, um, they don't meet today's demands. People have car chargers. They have hot tubs. They have smart this, smart that. They got, they've got all sorts of stuff that takes power. You know, and older services on some houses were 50, 50 amp services. Standard kind of even up until the 80s, 90s, you know, even the mid-90s was 100 amps. Nowadays we're putting 200 amp services. So that would be something that somebody's going to want to think about is the, the electrical um, uh, amperage service. Is the service going to be um, sufficient for the demand? Um, so that would be something to look at. So yeah, major systems, really electrical, roof, foundation, um, plumbing, you know, is, is the plumbing older galvanized? steel plumbing that the the flow is reduced because the bore is shrunken down. Um, that would be something to think about because if that's the case, it's real inconvenient when somebody flushes the uh, toilet and the shower flow reduces. Um, so, you know, something like that would probably take some some money to replace that system. So basically looking at the bigger systems, you know, in Santa Cruz County and even over in Silicon Valley, the housing stock is pretty old. Um, so those are those are things to take in mind when you're looking at an inspection report. How old's the house? You know, and these systems were, were all um, a lot of the systems, older like electrical and plumbing. They, they were the houses were built with these systems. Um, so these systems get old. You know, they need updating. So yeah, just look at the look at the major systems and and uh, you know take you know talk to your home inspector, ask them about the the report, what the big big ticket items are, and you know things like that. Talk to your real estate professional and. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that was kind of long and involved there, but well, no, it, it wasn't that long and involved. And um, yeah, I think that's that's a good rule of thumb is to check out the um, you know major components first and see what kind of issues there are you know with those. I mean, like you know the roof that's a, that's a biggie, right? Electrical can be Absolutely. really a big problem, and Absolutely. and the foundation. And you know, you mentioned foundation cracks, and um, so the horizontal crack is no good. <laughs> Vertical crack. Yeah. So yeah. vertical cracks are they less less bad than horizontal cracks, or what's the? Yeah, the why do you the mention horizontal, horizontal cracks specifically? Horizontal cracks um, versus a, a um, vertical crack. The vertical cracks are usually from from settlement of, of soils or and, and the structure. Um, you know, we have different uh, different environmental changes. So you have a, a winter that's that's heavy in rain, and then you have a couple years of drought. So the structures are always moving. They do settle. And those vertical cracks are, are typical usually, unless they're really wide or if they're pronounced everywhere. The horizontal cracks typically, um, they suggest more of a structural problem or a potential structural problem. And what happens when the, the, the uh, horizontal crack appears and it's not fixed, uh, there's, there's steel rebar typically in, in the foundation. And when that rebar starts to corrode, then the foundation gets weaker in that 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 area, um, and then that then that can in the future definitely cause settling to the structure and 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 bigger bigger structural problems. So those are the kind of cracks you want to uh, to fix right away. Um, I did want to mention though. So so if you're looking at a home inspection report and you and you you may actually get to this, Seb, you may ask me this question here. I'm not sure, but stop me if I'm jumping in too soon. But there's things that you want to take care of right away when you're moving into a house. If you see them on a report, um, oh, like, like what? Rob, did you, you hear me? Nope, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I was going to say there are things um, on an inspection report that should be done sooner than later. Um, probably the number the number one thing, well, not the number one thing, but one thing um, is any kind of plumbing leak. 
So, or roof leak. Water, water is kind of the root of all evil when it comes to uh, structures. You know, you want to keep the, the, the structures sealed and tight. And if you have a plumbing leak or a roof leak or anything like that, that, that can just wreak havoc and uh, cause all sorts of problems, and pretty quickly, too. So that would be one of the things you'd want to look for. And, um, to, any you know, kind of water um, issue. Yeah, absolutely. Any kind of water leak, any kind of moisture intrusion leak, because it can lead to all sorts of bad things and deterioration of, of materials. It can lead to mildews and molds and all that fun stuff. So water. You want to want to keep the water out of the structure and keep it where it's supposed to be. Right. That's actually a very, very good point. You know, like um, when my clients order a termite inspection, I say, you know, the big thing on here isn't termites ever hardly. It's usually rot from water, right? Water is like probably the single most destructive thing that happens to houses. It is. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. Um, you'll have things like a lot of times you'll see on those pest reports, and I note this as well, is a loose toilet. And people say, well, it's just a little bit loose to the floor. But over time, that toilet starts leaking down that subfloor. You may not know it for a while, and it can rot out the entire bathroom floor, and you would, you've got a big costly repair on your hands. And, you know, to fix something like that, it's, it's not very, very hard or very right. expensive. Most homeowners can do it. So, um, yeah, you wanted, that's, that would be something. I don't know if those are, those are, I guess that would be a red flag. That would be something that somebody would say, you know, again, not costly now to fix a plumbing leak that hasn't caused damage, but, man, that can be costly down the road. If it's you know left left unchecked, right, right, okay, good point. So, um, David, what kind of like like era of homes, maybe your type of construction or something like that, that you found has like the least issues from like a maintenance perspective? Is there any kind of home that jumps to mind that's more trouble free than others? Um, you know that that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I can really totally answer that. I mean, there's yeah, um, I mean, it, all the different eras have their their pluses and minuses. I I think um, I think today's homes are are probably if they're built well, the materials are are becoming pretty superior to the stuff we had in the past. You know, you have fiber cement sidings and laminate flooring that's bulletproof. You've got you know roofing materials that are lasting much much longer. Um, you know, but back back when Back when ho homes were built in Santa Cruz County in the late 1800s, we're using, you know, um, redwood that was, you know, from first growth. And, you know, I'll do a Victorian home and I'll see T111 siding that was added on in the 1980s or 70s, right along with the, you know, some of the original wood on that structure. And the T111 plywood siding is rotted out and the, <laughs> the original uh, siding next to it and, and framing is totally fine. So... Um, I don't know how to, how to really answer that question, but I, I do. I really like the new materials on newer homes. I think they're they're getting they're getting better. Um, you know, stucco siding is is always a, a pretty good thing. Fiber cement siding is a good thing. Um, huh. Yeah, I, I, I you know every every era of construction kind of has its its benefits. You know, the flat roofs of the 70s. Some of that stuff has kind of been a problem. Um, so flat roof meaning no pitch to it. So back right. when I was a kid, our, our house had some tar and gravel roof to it, and and I guess for the time that was fine. But but nowadays the flat roofing materials are are superior. You know we've got these membranes that last you know 40, 50 years that are basically completely watertight. It's like putting a a balloon over your house to, to keep the water out. So um, I don't know. You know I think it goes case by case really um, as far as you know if it if the house is. Um, is going to have problems or not, kind of depending on how old it is, has it been kept up, um, you know, and that's why I, I would, you know, go out and talk to clients after I inspected the home and say, hey, you know, this house was built in 1950, the, you know, a lot of stuff has been upgraded, but a lot of stuff is not, and this is the potential areas, these are potential areas that you might have problems with in the future, you know, kind of work it out that way. But uh, I don't see, I don't see an era of construction being horrible, you know, compared to compared to other uh, eras. That's just kind of my two cents on it. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, looking at these inspection reports, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that say, uh, you know, like immediate correction um, required, right? So is there any way you can tell if it's really like immediate correction required or something that you should, you know, correct in the next couple of years, say? Is there any way yeah. to... 
to, to notice like what's really critical that you better do this like before you move in maybe? I mean, because yeah, there, there yeah, isn't yeah. really that kind of like fine granularity I find in terms of like, you know, how critical the, uh, the, the correction that's needed is. I'll, I'll tell you what, I, that is such a good question. And I think that, I think that question is probably fundamental to um, a good home inspector and a good home inspection report. And I think that is why there's, there's a difference between a, 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 an inspector that can, is really good at what they do but can't convey the, the message across to the client. Um, I, we try to, I mean, me, me, the way I do it, and most home inspectors that are, you know, try to design our comments. And again, you're not going to get this with every inspector, but I try to design my comment that I will tell you, um, you know, what the implication is. So let's say I say um, the toilet is loose in the master bathroom. Fix it. Um, that kind of leaves you pretty, you're kind of vague. That's pretty vague, right? You're kind of like, okay, it's loose. Fix it. Um, I don't really, okay, well, maybe I'll fix it at some point. Well, we were just talking a moment ago about if a toilet is, toilet is loose, um, and it's leaking and you don't know that, there's major damage caused cause in the subfloor. So what I like to do um, in my comments is give you the implication. I would say the toilet is loose, but, you know, um, and if, if left unchecked, this can cause serious damage and costly repairs to the subfloor. And I think when people read it that way in a comment, they say, whoa, whoa, the toilet's loose. It could cause lots of damage. And my recommendation would be repair. Um, you know, have a qualified plumbing contractor repair that for you. They go, oh yeah, well this is this is something we need to do right away. So I think it really comes to the way that the inspection report, the comments are written. Um, ideally, buyers would be there if it was a buyer report, buyer's inspection. The buyers would be there, and I can convey that message to them verbally and in the report. But a lot of times with these transactions, we're doing them for sellers or we're doing them for buyers that are busy and working over the hill and or wherever, and, and they've got a life and they can't be there. Well, you have to design the comment so that the buyer who's reading the comment and the report understands whether it's important or not. Right. Okay. Well, that's very uh, good information. Now, um, so is there any way that they can prioritize those items? Like, I mean, what if there's like, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, is, is, is when, when you do a report, do you have like a prioritized list or how would anybody know, like, you know, even if they ought to be done like right away, is there... Yeah. Anyway, they should I, figure out how to prioritize those, or they work with a contractor I, on that, or. I really don't have. I don't have a. I do have a summary in the back of my my report that that condenses the report down to um, action items, specifically action action items. Some of those action items may be maintenance. Some of them, which maintenance is always important too, because if lack of maintenance can lead to, you know, deterioration of systems and components and appliances and things like that. Um, but I, again, I just um, I think it's up to the user to really read. Now, again, verbally, I can always go over these things, and, and that's a really good way to do it is verbally call me or, or, or whatever, or if they're at, on site, we can talk about it. But um, you've got to read the whole report. You've got to read the comments all the way through because the comments, if they're written properly, which I believe mine are, will tell you whether they're urgent or not. Um, wow. I, you know, and I do. I do have some icons that go along with my comments too. So I do have a, an icon that tells you if it's a safety problem or a safety issue, and anything that's a safety issue, you can just automatically look. And there's a little yellow icon that 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 tells me that's a safety thing. Safety things are always a higher priority. Um, but again, if it's if there's also things that that are, need to be corrected, like the toilet. The toilet's loose. It needs to be bolted back down, or or you know, the wax ring needs to be replaced. You need to get that done. If you read the report, read the comment. The comment should should direct you in in you know in in, in that kind of urgency. So if it's something like a light bulb needs to be replaced, I you know there's not a huge implication other than you may fall and trip if you have improper lighting. Um, so that's kind of how my reports are designed. But you know again, verbal is always good too. I always do a summary with with uh, with buyers and let them know what I think is you know you should jump on first. Anything to make anything for habitability of the structure. So if the shower doesn't work or the toilet doesn't work, that's a pretty obvious thing that needs to be taken care of. But I'm not sure if that answered your question. Well, you said something interesting there. You said, read the comments. So am I to be led to believe that you want people to actually like read these reports? <laughs> that is, yeah, that's, it, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's, 
you know, that's tricky too because you don't want to write a novel to where the person falls asleep and won't re re read the report. So there's a, there's a fine line there. You don't want to design the report where it's, it's just so, there's so much technical mumbo jumbo in there that the, the person reading the first comment is, is asleep and said, I, I, I don't even understand what this means. I try to design my comments to where um, I'm not using, you know, trade slang or, you know, I'm, I, I try to explain things that in, in ways that just people, common normal people that don't have experience with homes or repairs or things like that can understand them. So yeah, you, you definitely need to read the report. Don't just read the summary, which the summary is where all the meat is. That's where all the, the action items are. But read the whole thing. There's a lot of information in there that's useful. Um, but it, yeah, so I, again, I try not to make my reports too long. Um, with, with stuff that's going to bog, bog a reader down. Uh, but that's real important. Yeah, Seb, we need to read the reports. Read the report. So you can't just read, read the, the executive report. summary. You need to get in yeah. there and like, just go through it. Yep. If you're spending like $800,000, maybe it behooves you to spend an hour or yeah. half an hour exactly. reading the report. Okay. Exactly. Well, that's some good advice. You know, I've never actually heard that one before, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Read the report, exactly. Um, so uh, let's see here. What else did I want to ask you? Um, so like, I, I work a lot with sellers myself, uh, yeah. and um, I always or almost always advise that my sellers get a, um, a home inspection uh, before they put their home on the market. Um, now, uh, buyers, you know, they're always supposed to get their own inspections. So what do you feel about the sellers getting a home inspection? Do you think that's like worthwhile or you think it's just, just, just let the buyer do it? What's your take on that? I mean, I, I, you know, I, so when I'm, when I'm out doing home inspections, I'm never, never practicing, um, you know, I'm never stepping on toes of realtors and never playing realtor. I always tell clients, talk to the realtor. But in this case, I'll, I'll play realtor. Because um, I think that's that's um, I think with a seller working with the realtor, I think having all that information on the table is critical. I think it's a really good a good plan um, because that way that the buyer coming in already knows you know has a pretty good idea what the condition of that property is, and can do their own research and, and find out. You know the home inspection report says that this roof is um, is going to need replacement in the near term, and I need to see a, a, a roofing inspector. Or a roofing contractor, so that it's just power to it's power to the buyer and it's power to the seller. I think it's, I think it's, I don't know. I mean, personally, I think I if I was a real estate agent now, I would say I, I wouldn't sell a house without one. I think it's a real good thing. I also do um, inspections for sellers that that want to know the condition of their property and and that a lot of the stuff that they they fix themselves. You know, they feel like they want to they want to do. A, you know, this here because this was a safety issue or they want to replace this because they just feel better about somebody coming in and having that done. So I think it, I think it really benefits buyers and sellers alike. I think it's, a, I think it's the only way to go, to be honest. So, uh, you know, a lot of times when a seller gets a home inspection, a buyer will also get their own home inspection. I'm sure you've run into that many, many, many times. Do, you, yeah. do they give you the existing home inspection before you go out there, or do they ever give it to you afterwards, or do you not even know, or you know, what's that like? I, it, that's, that's a real good question, too. Um, I, I go behind other home inspectors all the time. So, you know, they'll, yeah, all the time. Um, and, you know, most home inspectors in the Silicon Valley, Monterey Bay area, they're good. Uh, we don't have, I don't run across very many home inspectors that I don't think that, that are good. Um, but yeah, sometimes the, the agents will offer the report, and, and I always look at them if they offer them up. Um, and a lot of times I'll get the inspection done, and um, I've gone over you know the summary with the buyers or seller. It wouldn't be a seller in that case, or with the buyer, and, and they say, oh yeah, we had an existing report. So a lot of times the agents don't tell me, and that's fine too. Um, I, I don't necessarily think um, I, I don't want to see. I don't have to see those reports. It doesn't bother me if I don't see them. I mean, I'm pretty confident that I will, will pick up, you know, um, pretty much everything that's that's going to, you know, be um, important going forward. Um, and, and inspectors do do have different styles too. Some inspectors write their comments different or call things out differently. But I think in general, um, you know. I mean, are you asking me whether you think it's good to have a, a go-behind inspection? Is that was that part of your question? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, I'm I just could, uh, interested. Oh, I'm just interested to to 
I guess what I'm getting at is like, what's it like when you have like some other inspection report? Like, like, like if you like if you're going behind somebody, do you get the report before they go before you go out? Do you get it after you go out? Do you like yeah. compare their report to your report or or anything like yeah. that? Yeah, I do. I mean, if if the, if the agent says, yeah, there's an existing report, but the buyer just wants to make sure, and it, I, you know, I'll say, would you want to send that over to me? And and they will or they won't. And either way, it's fine. I definitely will view it just to look at and see, you know, what what they have as far as the things. And I can look at those things a little closer when I'm there. And then I I always ask buyers before I do the inspections whether there's a report or not. If there's any concerns or anything they want me to look at closer. But yeah, it's pretty common. I think I do I do maybe thirty percent of my, my inspections for buyers, there's an existing report. I think we do I do quite a few of them. Um, and again, I don't always see the reports. And again, some reports are hundred and fifty pages long on an eight hundred square foot house and other others are thirty pages. So, you know, sometimes I feel like if I'm doing a report or an inspection behind somebody who has a, a novel written for that house and all the information is in there. The same things I found the same things, and our re, our, our you know our call outs are the same. All the deficiencies are the same. The information may be a little, little bit easier to digest for someone who um, you know I just did that report for in my 45 pages report as opposed to that 150. So again, all all the different reports they're all valid, they're all good, but there's just different styles and and things like that. So well, I find these big reports. I mean, they are, they're usually like basically like fluff. There's like a hundred pages, like "Hey, how to keep your home in good maintenance," right? It's like that's not really a report. It's I just, you just copied yeah. and pasted this in there, you know. And it's good, you know. I mean, like it's real information, you know, but like it's a little out of context, I would say, and I, I, <laughs> for I, a home I, inspection. No, and I think you're right, and I think that takes away from um, the importance of the inspection report because w the, the inspection report is supposed to note um, deficiencies and things like that, things that need improvement. So that other stuff is fine and well, but if you start concentrating on that, it may, it may throw your mind off of that last little little bit of information there that could have saved you, you know, thousands of dollars because you didn't fix that, that leak behind the, the, you know, the washing machine. Right, because so, you were distracted yeah. with uh, something else. Exactly. So, you know, when, when you do these home inspections, uh, the, somewhere in the beginning, it basically identifies the scope of the home inspection. And so when you go out to a home, you're not inspecting every single last little thing in there. So what kind of things do you not inspect um, that could be you know, common sources of problems for homeowners that they might you know, want to have somebody else look at? Well, um, so most of the stuff, components that are out of the scope of our inspections, most inspectors are actually pretty they're pretty up on those things and they actually know a fair bit um, about those systems, especially, you know, things that would potentially cause damage. Like, for example, um, a water softener. You know, water softeners are notoriously installed incorrectly, although they're beyond the scope of, of the home inspection. Um, most home inspectors, including myself, will, will call out, you know, installation problems. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. So even if it says in the report that we don't do that system, you know, we would note, you know, if we see something like that, we would note it as a deficiency, um, just as a courtesy. But main main things, you know, in rural properties we have around here, I'd say septic systems, obviously that's something that we don't look at at all. Um, you know, again, if we I see an open hole in the yard and somebody can fall in and, and, you know, hurt themselves, I would talk about it, but we don't do any testing on septic systems. Um, Wells, wells would be another thing. Although we do test, you know, water pressure at the um, at the exterior um, supply bib, we do check uh, water flow in the interior, so make sure that the water flow is good. Um, so we we would have an idea if there, there could be a possible well well problem, but we don't inspect wells. Um, but yeah, most of the components, like well, I don't inspect saunas. We I go to homes that have saunas, you know, inside, and I don't inspect those. I don't turn those on. Um, we don't inspect hot tubs. Um, I don't know if a sauna would actually have a potential, what kind of problem that would have in the future other than not working. Um, but And then the things like hot tubs, I, I do have to look at the safety features um, on hot tubs and swimming pools. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, if you're buying a house and swimming pool, you obviously have to have that look at, looked at. Um, but yeah, as far as, as, far as um, things that could be potential problems, I don't think there's a lot probably that we don't look at that could be a you know a big issue down the road. I think most of the stuff again, if we, if it's something there, we take a visual look at it and, and see. But well, what about like a retaining wall? Like oh yeah, retaining that's, wall that's is, 
Absolutely. That's a good question. So again, retaining walls, um, kind of the same thing as septic systems and wells. That's outside of the scope of what we do. But I, without a doubt, look at retaining walls. I mean, I, there's no doubt. Um, and if I think that there's a problem with the retaining wall, I'll, I'll note it in the report and suggest that having um, a client look at, look at that further with the engineer. But yeah, you definitely want to look at those. Yeah, so that's that's kind of that's kind of the, the gist said. Like we do have these things that we're not requi required to put in the inspection report or inspect, but we do look at them anyway, and then we we will comment on them, especially especially with something like a retaining wall or something like that, or or trees. Okay. There's big trees. You know, I'm not an arborist. I'm not qualified to inspect trees, but if there's trees overhanging the building or trees close to the building that could uproot the foundation or potentially fall on the house, I definitely talk about that in the report. Right, right. So how, how about that? Like, I don't know, like a few months ago, I went and saw a house in Los Gatos, uh, Los Gatos Mountains over there in, um, you know, what's it called? Redwood Estates, right? And uh, it had like these three gigantic redwood trees and the whole property is steeply sloped, right? And the house is kind of like halfway down the lot, like way far back from the street. I mean, the house is like... Uh, over a hundred feet far from the street, I would say, right? <laughs> so the trees on the bottom side of the house, these three gigantic trees that are growing up right against the foundation of the house, and like they built like a deck around part of the trees that's going up, right? Is that something you would con you would comment about? Is that an area for concern, or w that, what, do you, what do you feel about that? Absolutely, without a doubt, and and that is so common in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I mean, that describes. Um, thousands of houses, hundreds of houses up there. You know, that's super common. And I always talk about that in the report. You have to. I mean, those trees are not going to go anywhere. Um, and those trees are not getting smaller. And those roots are, you know, yeah, I mean, you have to talk about it because if somebody's going to buy a house and they're going to be in there, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, they're going to notice that that tree is that much closer to the property. I mean, there, like you said, there's, there's houses built with the deck built around the tree. I've, I've done, I don't know how many houses that have the redwood tree literally right up to the, the, the fascia board along the, uh, the roof line there. And it's right there. And they say, well, is this going to be a problem? I said, well, yeah, this tree is going to grow. So you have to, you, have to you know, take that into consideration when you're buying a property. Um, and there's a really good arborist. That's what you need to talk to an arborist and that they can kind of give you a little more of what they think is going to happen in the future with that tree. You know, they can kind of give you an idea of where the root, roots are, where the root system is. Um, on the property, you know, those, those redwood trees, the root systems go and go and go. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, trees are not out in the scope of my inspection, but um, something that's going to, you know, threaten the structure like that, you better <laughs> believe I'm going to talk about it. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, uh, have you ever seen that show on uh, TV called The Holmes Inspection? Have you seen that? I have, yeah, I have. I've, I've seen a few episodes, yeah. I've seen lots of episodes <laughs> of Holmes Inspection. And uh, yeah. for those of you who don't know, it's this guy. What's his name? What's his first name? I'm not Sherlock. <laughs> Mike Holmes or something like that. He's a so, yeah. ca uh, Canadian guy, and uh, the show is all shot in Canada. It's on HGTV or, uh, I don't know, Discovery or something. I don't know what, what network it's on. But this guy, Mike Holmes, he has this thing called the Holmes Inspection, and he always goes and laughs at all the bad home inspectors who have come through the property and missed all these things, right? And the reason why Holmes doesn't miss these things because he goes in with a hammer and immediately starts just, like tearing stuff out <laughs> to look behind the walls and like to find all the space that a home, home inspector could never find. And, and people may not realize this, but home inspectors, they're not allowed to do any destructive inspections, right? You guys can't drill holes in things, right? And, uh, yeah. and all that. So how, how can a buyer feel confident when you do a visual inspection? It's basically a visual inspection, right? Um, to, to know about you know, like the inner guts of a home if you can't actually you know, open the walls up and see what's going on behind them. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, think that, <laughs> I think that show, I haven't, I did, the reason I didn't watch too many episodes is because it wasn't really realistic. I mean, maybe it was, but I think a lot of that stuff was definitely... Um, oh, it's all fake. Of course, yeah, it's so, all fake. I mean, and, and, and 